So, hi, Mark. I guess your first computer was either BBC or ZX Spectrum. Is it right? Uh, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> my, my first computer was uh, a terminal connection to um, the Open University mainframe, which was about 250 miles away from the school in which I was studying. Uh, my first personal computer was a Commodore PET. Uh, this was like the is it the PET twenty or something? So it's before C sixty four, right? Oh yeah, it was way before the Commodore sixty four. It was a, I think it was a thirty two K PET. Uh, I wouldn't swear to it, but it had a external cassette tape, uh, and it was a you know one that came with a monitor, a cathode ray screen, uh, built in keyboard, um, that kind of thing that you you see on like nineteen seventies TV series. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had something similar, but mine was actual ZX Spectrum. So I hope someone from UK had a proper UK computer. Oh, yes, yes. They they came in a little bit after the pet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. And what was your first Hello World? So you started hacking immediately or you started gaming or what was, you know, or how old were you with your first uh, personal computer? My first program... Yeah, the, well, the first program was on this um, mainframe computer that I mentioned, which was where well, you recorded things in paper tape, <laughs> so you could play them back later on. And it was the um, it was battleships. It was a game of battleships. My first program on the Commodore PET was it wasn't a Hello World. It was actually a um, a program that mocked the login screen. So it basically was a blinking cursor and people could type things in and it wouldn't do anything and it would make them think that the, co the computer was broken. So it was a, maybe, a, maybe a mini hack, if you like. Okay, this is like, you know, taking the um, screenshot of, this, of, the, of the springboard on iPhone, right? And pretending this is like uh, the, the touch surface. Yes, yes. Yeah, very Just good. Just like that. <laughs> and what was the next usable program? Um, my next program after that was a game. Um, so this was the, the time where, you know, um, Space Invaders and, um, Asteroids and Donkey Kong, they were, they were big in the uh, arcades. So I started to write a Space Invaders, uh, game for the Commodore PET, um, never having played Space Invaders before. And only actually seeing stills in uh, PC World or one of the magazines at the time, so I kind of reverse engineered it from descriptions and from uh, from pictures that were in the magazines. Cool. And why you did it? So I mean, this is uh, this is the interesting question, though. Why someone starts, you know, tinkering with the machine? Uh, because I wanted to learn more about um, the possibilities with the with the Commodore PET and with personal computing computers at the time, I suppose, um, and. I also wanted to play a game, and games for the Commodore uh, in the UK were very few and far between at the time because it was an American computer company getting games across to the UK. You literally had to buy them in the States and have them shipped across, and it, with, with airmail at the time, it could be months before they turned up. Um, so I just thought it might be easier to try and kill two birds in one stone, learn how to use things like peek and poke, uh, machine code, uh, and also get a game out of it at the end that I could play with. So now you said it, so I'm really curious. So peek and poke, I actually never got it. So I also started with basic with its ZX Spectrum. But peek and pokes was like, you know, for me, like mystery. So uh, for me, was, I had, what is that? And how to know, you know, what happens if I peek and poke something? How you learned pick and poke? Do you remember that? Uh, you see, you are going back a long time. Uh, the first book I ever bought when I got the computer, which was very quickly after I got the computer, was a one from the uh, Commodore engineering team, and it explains well, it explained the hardware, but it also explained uh, how you could access the uh, the underlying um, machine code through peek and poke. So you could peek at a memory location, and you could that's the read operation. You could poke. Uh, where you could write um, characters uh, and code to that particular memory location. Um, and um, from that, I managed to figure out how to actually, you know, make it make it work um, with um, poking, uh, I think it was pixels, or equivalent of pixels at the time, so characters that represented, you know, the actual Space Invader uh, machines that were moving around the screen. Um, 
But to be perfectly honest, I can't remember too much more about that. You were you're going back like thirty plus years now. And and why I'm re why I remember my pick and pokes because if you would like to have a you know uh, to implement a game cheat, uh, you could just uh, pick something with a number and then you get endless lives. And I also thought, you no, know, how to know that? How it is possible that someone finds that out? Yeah. And uh, you are fortunate. My problem was I got a book, uh, basic programming in French, but I do not understand you know any French. So what I just did, I, I just you know, <laughs> I just wrote the code. And hope that something happened. It was, was really hard, you know, to find out what pick and poke actually does because all others, other commands were somehow, you know, self-explanatory. But pick and poke was like, you know, UFOs or something for me. It was like very strange. It's like quantum computing or something going on here. Yeah, I think I did write a program at the, around about the same time, which which maybe did something similar to what you're talking about. And it randomly, um, well, not randomly, but it was it was peeking and poking at various locations just to see what what happened yeah um, i did it in yeah. a loop but uh, but it crashed <clears throat> at one point of time i remember so sometimes you no know, uh, the colors change and then you know sound output and then it just stopped working and i said okay this is like yes uh, yeah, yeah. yes there, there were certain, there were definitely certain locations where if you i can't remember if you peeked them or you poked them but one or the other you could crash the machine exactly definitely so perfect so yeah. uh, we had a similar experience with different books and machines so you used the US yeah. road and I, 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 I took the UK. But I don't remember why the book was in French called ZX Spectrum Amstrad. But uh, anyway, so I, I think this was basic, right? PET 20? Yes, yes. Perfect. That was a version of, of mm -hmm. basic, yeah. What was your and next my, programming language? Well, my next programming language after that was, base, was basic as well. But it was because my next computer after that was a, was a BBC uh, Model B. So you mentioned that earlier. So I did go to that. I jumped ahead. I jumped over the spectrum. Uh, some of my friends got the spectrum. The ZX, actually, the ZX80 is what they started with and self-assembled that because I don't know if you can recall, but at the time you could get it in kit form and you could pay a little bit more and get it self-assembled. Well, um, the friends I had at the time were um, much more interested in actually building these things as well, which I think is is the right thing to have done at the time. Um, but I, I skipped that and went to the BBC, and it had, came with its own version of BASIC. So I started with uh, with that. Yeah. Uh, the first set of Spectrum, would I remember, uh, the commands were even, this was like a shortcut. Would I remember R or L was like run? So if you push a button, this was like the whole command, right? This was the rubber kit yeah. set X. Ah, this was an interesting story. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the membranes, yes. Yeah. And uh, and uh, this was still basic, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so on the on the BBC, it was it was a version of basic that they developed for. Um, they were doing a like an education program at the time um, on TV uh, for teaching kids how to, uh, well, and parents, I suppose, how to use a, the the newfangled computers that were out, and they they developed the BBC for that for education purposes. So they came up with their own variant of BASIC, uh, which which I think was great at the time. So I started with that. Um, but then I moved to Pascal and C quite quickly. Um, so you could get like plugins, uh, EPROMs for the BBC, uh, and they uh, enabled you to add additional languages. So you basically had to boot into a new language. So I, was, I learned Pascal and C on the BBC as well. What is, uh, what is your first uh, usable program? or application written in Turbo Pascal or Pascal and which one in C? Uh, oh, God. Pa so Pascal, it was probably for my university course, um, and it was a, um, a a hotel booking system. <laughs> don't, okay. don't ask me why. But they, they we had to do like a pretend that we were running a hotel and we had to write some system that kept track of the keys and the rooms and who was in the rooms and who had keys, that sort of thing. And on the, uh, the on C, my first real program for that was uh, a an operating system. So again, at the university, um, at the time, they were very much into teaching people operating systems and hardware mm -hmm. when you were learning about your programming languages. So we wrote a, 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 a pseudo operating system uh, to understand you know, memory locations and graphic chips and things like that. Yeah, th this is incredible. I never heard that. So this is uh, probably how, how Linus Torvalds also started, right? 
Uh, probably, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> hey, and um, and uh, did it actually work? So, could you boot the machine with your operating system? Um, no. So it wasn't. It wasn't that you actually booted. So like I said, it was a pseudo operating system. Okay. So it was. It was a program that ran in the operating system of the Beeb in this case. And it pretended to be like a, a an operating system in an operating system. I suppose these days you might think of it as maybe an early version of a Linux container, perhaps. But I wouldn't even go that far, really. <laughs> oh, cool. And, uh, okay, you did C. So you had your hotel booking system. Yeah. Then you wrote an operating system. And what was the next? C++? Um, so, yeah. So, the, the, well, actually, no. So um, at that point at the university, we were investigating other languages. And this was even before C++ came out. Um, so other languages we looked at were uh, Pascal W, which was a concurrent version of Pascal, uh, concurrent Euclid. Um, so we were, again, this was like second or third year at university, we were now moving into um, concurrency, funnily enough, you know, the dining philosophers problem and how you could um, how you could implement that on um, languages that were designed from the outset to be you know, concurrent in their nature. Uh, after that, so we're talking about 80, 85, 86, that's when the first version of C++ came out called Seafront. Um, beyond Straustrup, you know, he implemented that And it was effectively, if you if, if you can recall, uh, it was a a set of uh, preprocessor directives for C. So if you had C front uh, and you had a, uh, I, I don't even know if it was ANSI compliant implementation of C, but I know there were some restrictions on which versions of C it would work on. But if you had a one that was compliant with these restrictions, you could pretty much take Beyond's um, macros and, and 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 lay them on top of another C compiler, and you would get C++. So um, by that point, I'd actually moved to an Atari ST, um, and that came with a C compiler, and we moved the C front implementation onto the Atari so that we could play with C++ when we were at home rather than had to use it when we were in um, the university on our you know, our, our mini computers. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember the Björn Strustrup part because this is how I started also C and, with C and C++. And there was a thick book from Björn about C++. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to uh, learn C++. I also started with C. And the C in and C out, this is how you usually started the programming. And what I remember on Linux back then, there was, I think it was G++. And this was like, a, 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 what was it, pre-compiler or whatever. So it, it actually generated C code, which was then generated with GCC. This is what I remember back yeah. then. And uh, template didn't work so uh, very easily, so this was not very compatible. So this is how how I uh, started with C plus plus. And uh, uh, um, the first Linux uh, I used was a DLD, which stands for German Linux Distribution. D is uh, Deutsche, and this was yeah. like uh, I had you know to uh, to uh, decompose my machine and to look you know what the graphic chip is, and I had to put it in in order to install my Linux system. And then the next one was actually Red Hat. So one of the first I remember, which was nice packaging and the Red Hat. So I, I just saw it in, in a shop and bought it in Germany. And uh, yeah, this was, uh, I think, uh, the first uh, Red Hat uh, OS I used. And um, yeah, this, uh, but this was later, I think. I already had a PC. Uh, this is Atari. You, you said Atari. So this was probably, uh, so I used C++. It was 1995. And uh, yeah. you, you were earlier than that, right? Yeah, so we were, um, when I say we, I mean, so Newcastle University, this is like 95, sorry, not 90, 85, 86. We were actually oh, okay. the first, mm -hmm. we were the first university in the UK uh, to get um, C++. In fact, AT&T, where Beyond was at the time, you uh, used us as like a guinea pig uh, because we were, we were developing um, what became the, the Arduino transaction system at the time and looking for a new language that was a little bit higher level than, um, than C because we wanted to exploit object-oriented principles. So like I said earlier, we'd looked at a few other languages um, like concurrent Euclid, um, and um, we heard about um, C++ and we, we engaged with AT&T and, and they, they convinced us to use this instead of concurrent Euclid which in in, um, in hindsight was the right thing uh, 
for us to do. It was a really good thing for us to do. Um, but uh, it, it meant that in some ways we were we were guinea pigs for for Bjorn. Um, and and one of the nice things was um, he he used to visit us quite a bit um, and see how we were getting on with his language at the time, which was. I don't even think it was a one zero. I, I, I think it was like a zero one or a zero two or something like that. It was certainly pre GA. Okay, and uh, so so it means with the early C plus plus in Atari, you already started tinkering with Aryuna. Uh, yes, yes. Um, so uh, you mentioned Linux before. Um, so we did some work with um, with Andy Tannenbaum and Beyond Straustrup at the time as well uh, on Minix. So uh, I just wanted to kind of complete the circle on Linux because it's quite interesting, you know, how much we have in common. Um, so um, Minix didn't run on the Atari, um, so the Atari had its own operating system. Uh, but one of the things that we wanted to do was to have a Linux, or not Linux, to have a Unix variant on the Atari because we were u using Unix uh, in the university all the time on uh, on Sun machines and on uh, British versions uh, called the Whitechapel. Uh, so we started to port uh, Minix to the Atari, and we finally got that to work. But Uh, that was around about 1989, 1990. It was okay, but the Atari was was kind of uh, not a particularly great, uh, fast machine. Um, and then PC started to come out, and you know they obviously they were shipping with Windows. Um, and then Linus, um, I can remember being in the university with uh, one of my colleagues at the time. And we were reading uh, UUNet uh, news groups, and we saw this this email from this guy called Linus saying, "I've just written this. Um, it's like a, a bit like Minix, uh, a Unix variant. I'd really love people to try it out." Um, so we downloaded it. I think at the time it went onto a single three and a half inch floppy disk, um, and we took it home and we started to we tried to port it to the Atari to start with, but um, we eventually got it to work on a. I think it was a. 66 megahertz Pentium, um, and the rest, as they say, is history because that that was really the the the, the thing that kicked off, uh, at least for us, doing a lot of the work on on our Juno that uh, we could do at home rather than having to do it in the university. That's interesting because I was uh, five years later, so uh, I think my Linux journey began began 1995-1996 and I also used Minix in one point of time and then I remember yeah this is like five years later and I still know Minix I don't know why but um, I use this in my PC and my PC was Pentium 1 which was I think 90 uh, megahertz or something so it's not the first one it was, I remember 75 and then 90 I got the 91 and 8 yeah. megs of RAM I think X8 megabytes of RAM, yes, sounds right. <laughs> and and on that, I, yeah, I installed uh, the, the uh, Minix and probably even Linux. And I remember the stories like Linux had no money to uh, to buy Unix. So this is how he ported Minix to uh, to or, or made own Unix, which was called Linux. And uh, seems like you did something similar in UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is actually uh, really interesting. So. Um, I was absolutely not prepared, you know, for, for such a conversation today. So, uh, really nice. And, okay, um, and then you started with the, uh, how is how it's pronounced, Arjuna or Arjuna? Uh, so, Arjuna. Um, What it means? It's a, so, um, it's it's an Indian god. Um, there's a, a, a religious epic that they have in, in India called the Mahabharat. And he is one of the gods in um, in that uh, story. And uh, the reason we came with the name was the professor who created the project um, back in in eighty uh, six is is from India. And at the time, um, the U.S. Uh, research projects were going on in similar areas. Like there was Camelot, and there was Argos, uh, and a few others, and they were all taking like Celtic names. Um, and we we decided, even though. Kind of, we could have taken a Celtic name, given that we're based in the UK, and you know, these guys are based in the US. We decided we wouldn't take a Celtic name; we would take something that was from a different pantheon. And because uh, the professor Santosh Shrastava was from India, um, we decided to go with with India. Uh, so the project was called Arjuna, and we had different components within it that were named after other uh, gods in the Mahabharat. So our RPC mechanism, for instance, was called Rajdu, 
who was the um, the uh, the god, a bit like Hermes, um, but the the god uh, who would run go around on a big chariot, um, and uh, I think he was the messenger of the god gods. And like I say, we had other Indian um, gods within the project itself. So it seems like you didn't like US back then a lot, right? Sorry, we didn't like what? USA, US, because <laughs> <laughs> no. no. It, it was. It wasn't that. It was um, competition. I guess they, 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 yeah, it was. It was good. It was good competition. I mean, you know, we knew we knew them. They knew us. Uh, but it was just, you know, let's just do something different. Not not do Celtic because they were they were being used a lot of, uh, elsewhere. So it seems like the transaction research started before you joined the university, right? Or was it the same time? Was it you started the transaction stuff, or the other professors? Or what is the story behind Arjuna? So, uh, so Arjuna started in uh, in eighty five, eighty six. I joined the project in eighty six, eighty seven. But the work in transactions, uh, well, globally, had been going on for a, for a long time. Uh, within the university, it had started probably ten um, or or even fifteen years prior to that. Uh, so Arjuna, what Arjuna did that was different, as I mentioned earlier, was. Um, it was the time where, uh, you know, object orientation was starting to be the on, on the hype curve. Everybody wanted to do something through inheritance. So um, the project originally kicked off with how can you develop a transaction system um, that uh, allowed your object uh, or your business logic to inherit capabilities like from currency like persistence uh, rather than uh, have to have the developer uh, write them within the body of their code, which was typically what had to happen in, in previous uh, uh, implementations. On that note, uh, around 1998, there was a huge project where they tried in Java to create, you know, distributed integer, distributed string and so forth, which were, you know, uh, distributed by nature. It, of course, didn't work, but uh, seems similar to have everything, you know, by yeah. inheritance, transacted, and so forth. Uh -huh. uh, were you interested yeah. in uh, transactions, or you had to do transactions because university did it? Um, so I I wasn't interested in them at the start. Uh, the reason I got pulled into them was uh, I had just finished my undergraduate degree, and <clears throat> I did my undergraduate degree in, in physics, astrophysics, quantum mechanics, and uh, and computing. And I wanted to do a PhD, And my my physics tutor said to me, you could do a PhD in physics, but to be perfectly honest, unless you want to become a, uh, a lecturer in a university or go and work in CERN, um, your career prospects as a physicist with a PhD are, are limited. So maybe you should look at computing. Um, and then I went to my computing tutor and he said, yeah, we, you can do a PhD. And, um, there was, like I said, there was this project which had been going for about a year or so. And he said, um, maybe you, because he was Professor Srivastava, funnily enough, he said, maybe you want to look at this, um, and spend a few months determining whether there's something you would like to do in this area. And coincidentally, um, at that point, they were starting to look at high availability. Um, so transactions, you know, can give you uh, recoverability and the ability to replay things. But what they don't give you is the high availability aspect. You, you, know, you need replication for that. They didn't have replication in the project at that point. They didn't have anybody in the project looking at it. Uh, so it was a gap. Um, and he kind of pushed me in that direction to think about how you could do replication and transactions through inheritance, through object-oriented principles. And that's kind of how I became interested in transactions and, you know, it went from there. Was it already Java? No, 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 no. So this was, like I said, this was like 86, 87. Oh, okay. So it was, okay. all, it was all C++. Um, so Java didn't really come on the scene until um like i think actually so we started using it uh in 95 96 when it was still called oak mm -hmm. um but it didn't really have an impact on the arjuna project until about 96 97 when it was really when it had been renamed as java and why you transitioned to java from c++ <laughs> so this this is not a public this is not a secret uh so I've, I've said this a few times over the last few years because I see this happening with a with a number of new things that come on the scene. The reason we transitioned to 
to Java was it was kind of my fault. Uh, it was the shiny object syndrome. Um, Java had come on the scene. Um, some friends and I who were working on the Arduino project at the time, you know, we, we were playing with it, but we were really playing with it from the applet point of view. Um, like one of them, uh, one of my friends wrote a, you know, wrote a web browser in, in Java. I think I wrote a web browser in Java as well, but we were really writing games, uh, to run within the browser using the applet aspects of Java. Um, and then, um, one, it was basically it's one Christmas, uh, possibly 96, um, when I was at home with a, a laptop that by that point was running Linux and it had, um, I think it was Black Downs version of Java that was running on it. Um, I decided to try and just port, uh, the Arduino system to Java just for the hell of it. Um, but for no other reason than here was a new language and I thought, well, let's, let's see how it works and see what the, what the differences are between it and C++. And, and it took me, took me a few weeks to do it and to get it up and running. But from that point, we kind of decided we wanted to do something in Java as well as C++. And why Java and not, let's say, Python? So was Java some, somehow special to you or what's the deal with Java? Um, so I think, to be honest, I think it was the, the two, two things. One is, well, I've already mentioned that it was the new kid on the block. It was getting a lot of hype. Um, and it was similar to C++. The second thing was that, um, we were, um, and the, the university was a very big sun shop. Um, uh, so since I joined, um, the Arduino project, you know, in 86, um, we'd always had Sun workstations, you know, Sun 3, 360, 380, and then, you know, Solaris boxes. And um, despite the fact that we were buying more and more PCs running Linux, uh, when we when we needed to get bigger machines uh, with multiprocessor capabilities, we were always still buying Sun machines. And Sun came, and they were, um, they were very, very... Uh, pushy on Java, so you should try this. Um, and we all, because we were a big sun shop, we were also working, um, independently of Java, I have to say, but with some of the guys in, uh, in Sun Labs, like Jim Waldo at the time, uh, he, he knew us. We worked with him. He would come across and visit now and then. So I think it was the sun relationship, uh, as much as the, he is a nice new shiny object that looks a bit like C++. So Jim Waldo is uh, an interesting story because uh, Jim wrote a nice paper called A Note on Distributing Computing. And uh, in yeah. this paper, he mentioned that uh, if you distribute objects, they will never behave as they were, are not distributed. But uh, even 10 years later, everyone tried to have a you know, transparent distribution, which is really hard or if not impossible to achieve. Yeah. And, and in that paper, he cites, he cites Arjuna. Um, hey, cool. I can't remember. I can't remember if he cited it directly, but one of the things that we had done with Arduino when we were in C++ world was we had to write a stub generator. <clears throat> so in exactly the way that Jim was talking about, we, 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 because we had an RPC mechanism, we tried to make the distributedness of the objects um, um, opaque, if you like. Um, it shouldn't really be transparent because transparent means you can see through it so you can see what's going on. Everybody uses the word transparent when they really should be using the word opaque. So we tried to hide the distributedness and we wrote this C, this, uh, this stub generator, like I said, in C++. It took a C++ header file. It automatically generated you the client and service stubs. Your application used these stubs and didn't need to know that uh, it wasn't really binding to the real C++ object. Um, so we, we did that and it was used, uh, in a number of companies. Sun, Sun Labs used it. Um, IBM used it funnily enough. Um, HP used it. Um, but it kind of got, took on a life of its own outside of Arduino because it wasn't tied to transactions. You had any kind of C, C++, you could make it distributed with this. So I think it was more that that he referred to in his paper. Um, although he may have used one of the Arduino, uh, Ref, uh, papers to reference it. Um, forgot to mention, uh, you know the story behind Blackdown Linux? Um, no, I know some stories, but not. But which one? <laughs> yeah, which one? Uh, because I uh, interviewed Johan Foss, and he was actually behind the Blackdown Linux. He ported. Uh, he did a uh, uh, one of the uh, of the team members of the Blackdown team, and uh, uh, okay. 
Yeah, he, uh, Johan does now, you know, Java Vix is really uh, interesting, bright guy from Belgium. And uh, yeah, so uh, I interviewed him about Java Vix and we also had a talk about the history of Black Down. So um, right. it was an interesting one. I only remember at uh, Java 1 in one point of time, uh, um, Black Down was promoted as the Linux JVM. So this is what I remember. Yeah. But, I, I, uh, I have, yeah, sorry. If it, if it wasn't for that... I don't think a lot of Arduino would have happened as quickly as it did because there was no official Linux version of Java. That was that was the version that was out there. I don't know how they did it, but they did a great job of making it available. And uh, yeah, I got a lot of credit to them. Yeah, yeah. You have to uh, if you have the opportunity to just chat with Johan. This is really uh, funny and 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 a nice guy. Yeah. But. Um, Okay, so with uh, with Arjuna, what interests me? So this was like a whole framework. Um, so you, you said you ported or you ported to Java in a few weeks. So um, let's say uh, we have Arjuna right now. So how this would work? I would inherit from let's say Arjuna object, and I would inherit uh, transactionality and and distribution. So um, then you will generate these stops for me. I will get these stops, which are which are. Probably you get as, as some kind of uh, lookup system, right? It was as called Arjuna dot get, and I get this stop and call my object. Is it something like this, or was it something different? Um, so, <clears throat> so there are a number of ways of doing it. I'll just describe one of them. Um, so, in the distributed, the purely distributed case, we had we also implemented a name server. So you would do the lookup that you just mentioned on the on the name server where somebody would have published um, the the header files and the location of services that you could then use where these objects were residing. You go, you do a get, you would uh, you would download the header file, you would you know you would bind to that, you would um, you know compile, and then you do the invocation uh, with the endpoint that the name service had actually given you. And the service, if it wasn't running already, um, the Arduino system would spin up an instance of that service. You would do the work, and it would it would do the work, and it would return a result. And typically, it would then shut down the service after a period of time. Uh, obviously, you may want to do multiple requests, so that would why why it would keep it up for a bit. Because spinning these things up and tearing them down is you know it's not going to be happening uh, but that quickly. So it's like uh, and serverless environment, right? Exactly. I wasn't going to go there, but yes, very much like a serverless environment. Very good. And um, and the transactions were similar, so they were just uh, what actually transaction meant. Because uh, if the transactions are distributed to another object, the object will have to care about you know the big about the semantics. But you implemented some kind of a store as well. So what was what were yeah. the transactions behind here? Yeah. So, so we implemented a, a, a persistent object store that uh, could use a database uh, or flat file, for instance, to store the the state of your object. And you, as a user, what all you had to do was inherit from a class called Lock Manager, um, and then um, you know this is like I say this this is C plus um, plus. The Java one was slightly different, uh, but in C plus plus, there was no serialization. So you had to uh, provide methods to save and restore your state to uh, like a normative uh, buffer format, um, byte, you know, a network byte ordered format, which we did for you. All you had to do was basically call pack and unpack um, with the various types. So you, you had to provide those in your, in your class that inherited from lock manager. Then all you had to do in the methods was specify whether a method was a read method or a write method. So that the system, when transactions were created, would know whether to get a read lock or a write lock. Uh, but you didn't have to worry about transactions at all. Uh, apart from starting and, and ending them, uh, the Arjuna system would take care of you know, propagating the context, making sure that state was saved and restored at the right point, doing recovery in the event of crashes, um, pretty much everything else. Also, two-phase commit or XA was also supported, or just uh, you know um, how to call so, it local transactions. So, two-phase commit <clears throat> uh, was the default. We uh, we added XA support uh, afterwards. We started with a very generic two-phase commit protocol, not tying it to XA. Okay, and uh, what I'm curious right now, um, if you if you look at the XA open specification or uh, uh, XA itself, um, there are some corner cases where two-phase commit 
can fail. There, there are heuristic exceptions uh, where you have to be aware of. So um, my my impression is you, you cannot just use uh, two-phase commit, let's say, transparently or opaquely. Uh, you have actually always to handle the corner cases, right? Uh, by by you, do you mean the like an implementer of Arjuna or, or an no, application? No, uh, the user of Arjuna or the user of an application server. Let's make it more broad. So we have the same problem right now. It's the same spec. Yeah. So the yeah. developer so, has has to be aware of XA and handle the corner cases, right? Yeah. So so in the XA case, they absolutely do. So um, the reason that XA introduced heuristics was because in strict two phase commit, there are no heuristics, um, and that that. That has a good point in that there are no heuristics. <laughs> it has a bad point in that in order to have no heuristics, it means that the system could block forever. It could block a, you know, hold a lock on a resource for until the heat death of the universe. So heuristics were introduced in, in XA to enable a system that gets into such a state to make an independent uh, decision to either commit or roll back. Uh, but that could be the wrong decision later on if, you know, if other participants went in a different direction. So that's why heuristics are, are in XA, but they weren't in the, uh, not in a, a traditional uh, strict two-phase commit protocol. Uh, but but getting to your point, as a result of that, you absolutely do need to understand that there could well be situations where the transaction system has 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 done what it can, but it's possible that you end up with a non-atomic or a heuristic outcome, and, and you have to be able to deal with that. Yeah, my, my favorite is heuristic hazard. It's like uh, the transaction branch may have been heuristically completed. So this is what, what I like the yes. most. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, or, and, or heuristic mixed, where it doesn't tell you, it says some may have gone to roll back, some may have gone to commit. And it's up to you to figure out which. <laughs> and uh, why I'm asking is because uh, in um, I get lots and lots of questions regarding, you know, how to handle transaction in microservices. And people ask me, you know, about two-phase commit. And what I see all over the place in all code reviews actually i never see you know the corner cases handled so they are completely ignored they are just lock out and that is and if you yeah. if you do xa exception X, uh, xa transaction in that way your system can actually become inconsistent so what 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 it means is uh, we cannot we could do this absolutely for microservices as well but the problem doesn't disappear and the error handling in such cases might be hard. So the, if we already have microservices, it might be a better idea, I know, to uh, to solve the problem with business logic or with business compensative transactions and not rely on the infrastructure, right? Yeah, um, that that's not that's not unique to microservices. We we you know, we had the same discussions back when we were doing uh, service oriented architecture, which you know we could argue is that the same as microservices, but that's probably a completely different topic of conversation for another 40 minutes um but we had these going back let's say 20 odd years um i think <clears throat> the end the result that we came up with back then pardon me is very applicable even to microservices it's that uh, no one transaction model is right for every single use case so if you understand what's going on with heuristics and you're happy with with being able to deal with them then strict two-phase commit with heuristics that X, xa pushes is is probably right for those use cases, but it's absolutely not right for all of them, and particularly long-running uh, interactions where failures can be quite common. Um, I would not recommend, you know, uh, acid transactions, and that's where compensation transactions are, are are much better. But even within the domain of compensating transactions, there can be multiple approaches which could be better for some use cases uh, than others. So I think, um, you know, if you look through the literature. Uh, you'll see there are a number of different approaches to uh, to what's often called extended transactions, and they're they're always um, coming with you know these are the use cases that we're trying to solve, but please don't try and put them into other use cases because they may not actually be right for them. Yes, and I think the gist of of all of this is. Um, Two-phase commit code or distributed transaction code without handling the corner cases is just wrong, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. This is the, this is what uh, what what this was my idea so long, and I wanted just to chat, have a chat with you because more background with transactions, and uh, this is what I, also what I see. There is a no so pendulum swings back and forth between transactions are great and we don't need them, 
and it happens every 10 years. So uh, it started, I know, MySQL, we don't need transactions, then transactions were important. And I think, you know, transactions and no transactions in any larger applications have to be side by side, and you really have to know what you are doing. Otherwise, it won't work. Yeah, we, we saw... We saw exactly that point with with NoSQL. Uh, I don't know if you can recall, but you know when NoSQL first kicked off, um, the the implementers and the vendors were saying we don't need transactions because clearly that's one of the things that you know traditional uh, relational databases tend to do very very well. Um, and and even Google at the time, you know, was saying you know they we don't need uh, transactions in in their implementations. But over the years, it's kind of flipped and come back around to. Many implementations uh, now having transactions, including Google. You know, if you look at Spanner, for instance, um, Google uh, pushes that as a you know transactional, uh, consistent, uh, global, globally accessible, uh, uh, NoSQL uh, data store. Uh, so you're you're right. It, it's kind of uh, things come in cycles. Yeah, and, and the same is uh, SQL itself, right? Because uh, all NoSQL stores are now SQL capable, and not even that. <laughs> SQL became incredibly popular. Actually, all the messaging systems like Kafka and Flink and all the others, they support SQL as well. Also, they have nothing to do with databases. So uh, I'm just waiting, you know, for the first database like SQL only or something like just SQL uh, movement right now. So it's uh, completely yeah. crazy, actually. Yeah. Well, the, again, I don't know if you can recall, but when no SQL came out, it was the NO bit was meant to be no SQL. There yeah, was exactly. no SQL and then people tweaked it to mean not, not only. only. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's probably, you know, it's just like, now, like SOAP is no more simple object access protocol. Like no is yeah. like, I don't know, um, kind of, I, I don't know what it would mean, but probably not only SQL rather than we, we are able to provide SQL, something like this. Okay, um, yeah. nice. So this, um, in one point of time, Arjuna became, Java only, or was it always C++ as well? Uh, so <clears throat> uh, it was C++ and Java. Um, we, when we were acquired by a um, J2E vendor called Bluestone, uh, oh. so this is back in 2001. So uh, then they were acquired by HP in um, like 2002, I think. And, and HP kept the C++ uh, uh, going as well as the Java one. Um, but after uh, after we span out of HP uh, and created a, another startup, we we just focuses we just focused on Java. So from around about 2002 2003, that's when uh, the the C++ was was basically stopped, and we just focused entirely on Java. What was the name of your startup? Um, so the first one that was acquired by Bluestone was uh, Arjuna Solutions. And then when we started out of HP, it was Arjuna Technologies. Uh, maybe it was the other way around, but was we okay. had those two companies. And was it uh, in UK only or were you, uh, were you located in the US at one point of time? Uh, so when we were acquired by Bluestone, uh, we were only in the UK. We had an office, offices in Newcastle and London. Uh, after Bluestone... Um, Obviously, with HP, HP is global. Bluestone were global. Uh, when we span back out of HP in 2002, 2003, we were just UK again. Okay. Um, and in one point of time, I think uh, JBoss acquired you, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, JBoss uh, did a partial acquisition uh, of uh, Arjuna Technology, uh, the transaction stuff, uh, in 2005. So that's when I joined JBoss, uh, taking Arjuna um, with with me and, and another guy. Um, we went across and joined JBoss. But Arjuna, the company itself, continued on and continues to this day doing other things. Ah, I didn't know this. So uh, how I found about Arjuna was um, JBoss back then uh, supported two-phase commit or uh, X8 transactions without knowing what JBoss was doing. So if JBoss crashed, he yeah. didn't he didn't remember, you know, the state of the transactions. It couldn't, re, um, it couldn't proceed after after rebooting. So there was no, like, transactional locks. And my um, what I remember is uh, JBoss acquired Arjuna to have this persistence um, that, uh, that uh, the transaction yeah. manager knows after restart how to proceed, how to, you know, uh, pr proceed with the with the protocol with the XID with the with the XA protocol, 
And uh, Arjuna, I thought this is another company because there is a J like Java. So this is why I ask you about the history. And uh, and since then, J was actually supported a true two-phase commit protocol, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And uh, now I'm curious. So you have a background from uh, C++ and Arjuna. If you if you started with uh, with JBoss, what is your impression of uh, EJB's remoting and transaction? You thought this is complete crap, or you said it could work. So what was your relation, you know, to the back EJB Java in transactions? So um, all of that happens at, without without my involvement. <laughs> so so J2E at the time when J2E kicked off, like. In 1980, sorry, 1998, 99. Um, I think it was, you know, it was Sun, it was DEC, it was IBM, it was HP. It was, a, it was a few other companies. I was still at university, so I was still, you know, working at, on the Arjuna project. Um, I don't, I don't remember having much to do with it apart from looking at it and thinking, this looks very much like a, a Corba model that's just been translated into Java. Um, and if you look at transactions from that point of view, you know, JTA and JTS, JTS is just the Java language mapping of the OTS. Yep. Uh, so it does, does kind of match that. Um, I, I just went with the flow. I didn't, uh, <laughs> my involvement in it was not, was not much at that stage. No, but I know, but, uh, you know, you joined JBoss, then you were confronted somehow with the J2E world. So you saw everything at once, probably. So you had probably your thoughts, you know, so what I did, you know, terrible J2E or you were impressed by J2E or by JBoss or what was, you know, what was your impression of, of the whole application oh. server thing back then? Oh, well, we, so, so I've been working with application servers, though, since we got acquired by Bluestone. So Bluestone was an application server vendor at the time. Uh, HP, when we, when we were acquired by HP, we, we came and we, took the Bluestone app server and, and made it the HP app server. So I was, I was working in app server since 99, 2000. Um, so I, you know, it wasn't, my first impression wasn't JBoss. Um, I think, um, what, what was different about JBoss though was the fact it was all open source and that was very eye opening. Um, you know, coming from a closed source background with HP, I always heard all oh, these open source guys, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, they'll, 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 they'll be writing crappy code. It won't go anywhere. But then when I actually looked at JBoss, it wasn't. I mean, okay, they were, they had some issues with transactions. You're right. But, but generally it was, it was pretty good code. I was, I was impressed. Okay, so so what was your impression at uh, at Bluestone back then? So it, uh, I think then you saw the first time J two E, right? Yes, yes. Um, back then, <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably that. Oh, this is this is quite complex. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and but coming, like I said, coming from a Corba Corba model, uh, I could see why it was complex. Um, I you know I was surprised that. Simplifications hadn't happened at, the, at that point, but you know, I was still kind of, as they say, wet behind the ears with academia and thinking, this is, you know, obviously these guys have been driving this from an industrial point of view. They know better, um, so there are good reasons why it has to be this way. Uh, in hindsight, I can see there weren't really that many good reasons that I thought there were at the time. I think one of the reasons is because there were lack of, lack of annotations in Java, right? Because if we uh, there was no way to attach uh, yeah. efficiently metadata to to the source code, and you only have you know to yeah. use a lot of XML, and this was the problem. So um, if you do it this way, it's really hard to implement. So so then you have you know to have the uh, the and there were also no not even dynamic proxies in place. So you had to generate all these tabs. So with uh, starting with JDK 1.3, I guess, there was a dynamic proxy was introduced and all servers switched to dynamic proxies. So, and then this was roughly uh, a few years later, we got uh, Java E5, which was a greatly simplified. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and then CDI came along and everything got a hell of a lot better. Yeah, perfect. And uh, then you, are, are you now CTO? Or what's your role at Red Hat right now? Yeah, so I, I took over as JBoss CTO when, when Sasha Labore left in 2000, 
2009, um, and I'm also VP of engineering for for all of Middleware. So I still have all the JBoss guys under under me, and you know various acquisitions that we've done over the years, like Fuse and Three Scale and and others um, to grow you know grow the group. Mm -hmm. um, because I know you actually from conferences, and you delivered uh, uh, several talks which I really enjoyed. I remember one in London. Uh, JAXORS and transactions. So, you just, you, so the idea was you know, to, to 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 push the context remotely with via REST, and then lots yeah. of tr transaction talks, and I really enjoyed them. They were like uh, you know, and then uh, I just wanted to talk with you about transactions and stuff like that. And um, what is your opinion right now about uh, just Java E or Jakarta E? I don't care on micro profile. So um, so what's What's your opinion about? So you, you like obviously you have to like that, otherwise you wouldn't be a CTO. But uh, <laughs> but what's uh, um, yeah? What do you think about that? I'm just curious. So um, let let's let's start with the easy one. Uh, so micro profile. I think micro profile is has done great. Um, I I don't have as much to do with it as I as I once did when you know when I helped kick it off. Uh, but you know over the last two uh, almost three years, if you look at what The, the community has done in terms of you know new specs and and collaborative implementations in in open source it's it's really really good to see uh, at, at, but for no other reason it shows that there is a lot of interest in in evolving um, enterprise Java um, towards you know the cloud and microservices I think it's 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 good to see so many new things getting added uh, and like I said being done in a in a very collaborative um, vendor neutral uh, manner um, so you know Java EE um, you know we obviously we kicked off micro profile because Java EE had kind of stagnated uh, whether you know Oracle at the time wanted to admit it or not you know it had slowed quite a lot it wasn't being reactive enough to changes in the industry um, and um, you know that's I think that's that that's that is history now. You know, we 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 kind of got to the whole Jakarta E side of things now, which was was a great move for Oracle to make back in 2017 when, um, you know, when they approached Red Hat and, and IBM to help move Java E to uh, a foundation, which turned out to be Eclipse eventually, under the Jakarta banner. Um, I think it took a lot of guts on on Oracle's side to do that. So a lot of credit to them. Um, But you know it hasn't moved as quickly as I think um, some people would have liked, and, and I would include myself there. Um, there's been a lot of a lot of issues with with the legal aspects of things. Um, perhaps those legal aspects could not have moved any quicker than they have done. Um, it's really not my um, not my position to comment on that. Uh, but I do think almost to what happened with Java E. It, it has had an impact in terms of the perception is still that it's not moving very quickly. Um, so, you know, if we want to do more with, with Jakarta EE, uh, either as a, as the existing collection of specifications or as, you know, pruned version of specifications, if we want to try and, um, you know, end of life some things that perhaps aren't necessary in, in going forward, I think we need to absolutely come together as a community and start to work on these things quickly and iterate very, very quickly, very much like what we've done in micro profile. I think, I think that's the only way to, to work these days. We, we, we can't be working in, you know, in bodies, whether they're open source bodies or standards bodies and, and coming out with new versions every 18 or 24 months. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, for me, the micro profile, I was also involved at the very beginning, but then I lost the interest a little bit because all the vendors tried, you know, to push their own uh, runtimes. Even you had Whitefly Swarm, and I never saw the point. It's like, what is the actual use case behind Whitefly Swarm, Pyara Micro, and all the others? Because, I mean, it's not like Whitefly is too big. The uh, Whitefly Swarm is a little bit smaller, but it's not like, you know, orders of magnitude is smaller. And then something interesting happened, starting, I would say, one and a half years before or for two, two years, uh, vendors ship both uh, Java 8 and MicroProfile at the same server. And this is how I was really excited because I could just, you know, ship the application with everything I needed, Java 8 plus MicroProfile. And this was like enterprise on, on steroids. And, um, and uh, I would say I, I'm not really concerned that Jakarta is moving slow because for me, Jakarta is, is more or less 
the you know, stable operating system. Yeah. And the micro profile is like where the innovation happens. So that, that's where I get, you know, four, four releases a year, a couple of new features, you know, every few months. And if you combine both, this is like the killer platform, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, I think exactly kind of the way you, you put it, that Ducati is, is the stable platform, backwardly compatible, it works, it's bulletproof. Various implementations are there that can can prove this, and, and and many of them are very very small as well. Despite what some people might might be suggesting that they're monolithic, they're, the monolithic implementations are pretty much gone. Um, and MicroProfile can layer on top of that, and that can provide the faster moving, more uh, innovative way of of addressing new new problem spaces, whether it's microservices and cloud, or maybe even Internet of Things as well. And uh, just wanted to ask you, you mentioned enterprise Java. What the enterprise mean for you? What, um, is, what is enterprise? I'm just curious because I heard, uh, I also use the term a lot and people ask me, what do you actually mean by enterprise Java? What, and, and this is actually, what is the definition of enterprise? So good, good question. And, and I should probably write it down. I think my definition of enterprise Java, when I'm, when I think about it, I'm, I'm implicitly thinking about um, environments that, that pretty much require 24 by 7 um, support, high availability, uh, highly reliable, uh, mission critical is another term, uh, systems where if they go down, um, they they could potentially kill people. But, you know, I know Java has this big caveat, it should not be used in nuclear power stations, that sort of thing. So maybe we shouldn't go there too much. But, but if not kill people, certainly make them very, very unhappy for the duration that they're down. And um, those are those are things that your your average developer doesn't necessarily need to, to think about, you know, whether going back like 30 years when I was writing my Hello World program or my uh, my hotel booking system thing, it wasn't going to hurt anybody apart from maybe my grade if it didn't work. Uh, that's not an enterprise system, but there are a lot of examples, air traffic control, healthcare, banking systems. I think they're all enterprise. Yeah, uh, you are absolutely right with that, but I would even expand. So for me, it means it always meant something completely different uh, from the developer's perspective, because if I think about enterprise, I see, you know, the typical corporate developers. And the corporate developers, they are very... Uh, how to call it, uh, they are very into business logic. So they are the masters of domain and they are absolutely not interested, you know, to follow whatever hype without a reason. They only would like to have, you know, the stuff working. And for me, enterprise also means that you can install the, the, the runtime in a few seconds or minutes and without any fiddling, without, you know, looking for best of breed technology just to start implementing the use case in the very first two minutes. So this is uh, this is incredibly important. If if this wouldn't be the case, I think Java E would die completely because you know no one would like in an enterprise uh, uh, or in a, in a larger company to investigate every few weeks. You know which set of frameworks could make sense and which doesn't. Yeah, no, I agree. Yes. So the opinionated part for me, this is why I actually do the whole Java E thing. This is what I like. I just pick you know whatever server I like. Um, Yesterday I did white flight. To, uh, tomorrow we'll do Payara or Open Liberty, and I actually don't care. So I just download the server and and pick whatever my clients have. And uh, the cool story is, I believe the projects, the clients are not alone. They can completely rely on Stack Overflow, Red Hat support, or whatever. And this is for me also a big part of uh, of enterprise. And I was a little bit concerned with the Eclipse uh, profile uh, uh, discussion at the beginning that we get you know fifty different profiles from Jakarta E. And then we will lose this uh, developer experience. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think <clears throat> I know there's still some conversations about you know how we address the the whole Java X namespace thing and profiles have come up. Uh, you know, I remember when we first had the discussions about you know even including the web profile was that seven or eight years ago. Uh, there was exactly that point. We you know if we have profiles, let's make sure that they're all well defined. But there should be somewhere between one and maybe four. But let's not look at num you know defining profile number one hundred and fifty four because that that doesn't give you as a developer any kind of uh, surety that you can move your apps from one implementation to another. 
Yeah, and there should be, in my eyes, a killer use case for every profile. It's not like we have a profile, yeah. small, uh, mid-range, and full, because uh, right now all run times are tiny. And by the way, we don't yeah. have time for that because it will be too long, but uh, my feedback about Quarkus, I don't know whether you're also aware of Quarkus, I guess you are. <laughs> this oh, is the, yeah. the first runtime where I clearly see the killer use case. So I ignored everything, but I, uh, if I look at Quarkus, it makes sense. Developer experience is great. Uh, the, you get a huge benefit if you really go, if you really cross compile it to the, or how it's called, to the native uh, kernel. And because yeah. you get, you know, it's a fraction of, it's not, we are not talking about lightweight. It's like a tenth or even uh, less uh, of, of the thing. So I would say um, we should schedule another podcast just about Quarkus, but uh, this is the right direction. And uh, what I just did uh, recently, I co couldn't resist. I created an archetype called Quarky. This is basically Quarkus with all dependencies I need at once because I don't like, you know, to add all the extensions over and over again. I need Quarkus with full, all micro profile and, and stuff like that. So um, so this is the only thing. But uh, I think it will come later. So you get, you know, uh, Quarky or Quarkus, let's say Java E like. You, uh, I mean, yeah. Quarkus with most opinionated extensions, something like this. So you get, you know, it, it will feel more like a uh, white line. And yeah. my. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm happy to do another one about Quarkus as well. It's, uh, it, it's very interesting to get your input on that. Yeah. And um, now the question is, uh, where people can find you uh, in the internet, Twitter, GitHub, uh, Red Hat, or whatever? Um, so my, my Twitter and GitHub handles are exactly the same. They are NMCL. Um, it's, um, well, it's my initials plus N at the start uh, for Newcastle. And they can find me on uh, at Red Hat. Um, my email address is mlittle at redhat.com. It's not, not a private thing. So anybody who wants to reach out to me at any point about anything, is more. I'm more than happy to hear from them. Yeah, cool. So thank you, Mark. And uh, I will invite you again because we have uh, one topic without introduction. So we have full hour um, idea would be talk about Jakarta E, Java X namespace microprofile. And the other topic would be obviously Quarkus. And probably some, you know, microservices and transactions. There are lots of to talk about consistency and if you like at any time. So thank yeah. you and bye. That's great. Thank you very much. Bye.